Bevy 0.12 introduced the ability to extend materials. And if this is the first time you're hearing about materials in Bevy, then materials in Bevy are effectively shader programs written in WGSL paired with the data they need to function. This means that you can write GPU programs to create almost any effect you've seen in your favorite video game. The driving force for this feature was born out of a desire to extend Bevy's standard material. So it makes sense to ask, what is standard material, and why do we care so much about extending it? Bevy's standard material is full of complex behavior that's already been implemented for you. From choosing between a base color and a texture, deciding how metallic or reflective the surface is, applying normal parallax and depth maps, and new in Bevy 0.12, dictating how light should pass through an object. With all of this functionality, sometimes it makes a lot more sense to keep it around and write a little bit of code to allow what exists to keep working. Standard Material then implements a trait called Material. And new in Bevy 0.12, we have a trait called Material Extension that allows us to extend materials. We've got two examples to go through here, one from the Bevy repo and another that I've written. So let's dive into the Bevy example. This Bevy example is called Extended Material in the Bevy Examples folder. It takes advantage of the new Material Extension trait to extend the standard material with a quantized color output. The word quantized means to restrict the number of possible values, so you can think of this as a sort of tune shader that restricts the possible colors on an object, resulting in a banding effect that you can see from the lighting. Now, we totally could have written a tune shader ourselves, but the power of material extension really comes into play here because the standard material already knows how to apply lighting. So by extending the standard material, we don't have to implement integration with Bevy's lighting systems. First, like any regular material we create, we have to define what new data we care about. This is the data that will get passed to our shader. Data for shaders gets passed via bind groups that are indexed. So bind group zero is data Bevy controls relating to the view, and bind group one is going to be our materials data. Let's keep that in mind for when we look at the shader. Continuing on with that though, our data has a group index and a binding index. We just talked about group indexes, and you can see that our binding index here is number 100. The standard material uses a series of indices for the uniform data, as well as textures and samplers. These indices start at binding index zero, so we place our my extension uniform index at 100 to make sure that we don't overlap with the data that the standard material has defined and is expecting. Then we define our data, which is a quantized steps with a type of U32. With this data set up, we can implement material extension. This is where we specify which shaders we're going to override. By default, we'll end up using shaders the standard material implementation of the material trait has defined, but we override the fragment shader, and in this case, also the deferred fragment shader. Note that we have two overrides because the extended material shader can run in forward rendering mode or deferred rendering mode which is new in Bevy 0.12. The standard material and this extension support both methods of rendering, but we'll only use one at a time, typically defined by the Bevy app itself. If we scroll back up, we can see that making use of this extended material is basically the same as using any other material. Our query must get mutable access to the assets database for the extension and the material it's extending. And then when spawning in a mesh, we can apply the material and add it to the materials database. Note here that we're using extended material with a base of standard material, which is the base material that we are extending, as well as our extension called my extension with our quantized steps. With the Rust code set up, we can take a look at our shader. Receiving the data we specified in our extended material is just like any other material. We're in group one and binding 100 like we specified earlier. With this data, we want to effectively use the standard material shader behavior while adding in our own behavior in the middle to quantize the colors. There's a number of different functions we can use to interact with that base material. In this case, we're using PBR input from standard material, which does a lot of the access and some computation for us. This ends up giving us a PBR input, which includes our standard material data in the material field, which we can see used right next to it, as well as some other calculated fields. From here on, we can do whatever we want. In this case, we're taking the material from our standard material, we're accessing the base color, and we're setting the B value equal to the R value. In this case, a color would be defined as RGBA, or red, green, blue, alpha. Later, we take advantage of this by using first apply PBR lighting, and secondly, main pass post lighting processing. Our quantize effect is this one line on line 48. So while proportionally we've still written quite a bit of code here, it actually was a lot less than the standard material extension that had to exist before Bevy 0.12 and the material extension trait. It's worth noting that we've completely skipped over deferred rendering, which means that we didn't even talk about this if def with prepass pipeline, 
which controls a few things. Let's move on to the dissolve shader though. A very similar example is this dissolve shader. I used to copy and paste the standard material code into this shader and my rust code, which was a huge maintenance headache. So let's see what's changed. But first, let's take a look at this shader. It's a dissolve shader that discards fragments and you can see the actual shadows are reflected in these discarded fragments. That's why we have a pre-pass fragment shader as well as a fragment shader. This is what allows the shadows to actually show up. And if we switch from none to the depth texture, we can still see this sphere dissolving. Again, we'll see that with the normals as well, but that's less interesting. So back in the normal output, we've got the same extension mechanism as last time, except we're not using data inside of our dissolve extension, and we've implemented material extension for that dissolve extension with the addition of pre-pass fragment shader as well as fragment shader. Note that we specifically are not using deferred fragment shader because I chose to not implement the deferred support. First, we'll take a look at the pre-pass, and then we'll take a look at the regular fragment shader. The pre-pass is required to make these shadows work as the output of the pre-pass is used in the shadow generation. The beginning of this pre-pass shader is basically copy pasted from the default standard material pre-pass shader, which I'll link in the description. Then I removed some things I didn't need. And I also added a binding for the globals. Now I didn't necessarily need to add the binding like this, but I did choose to. At the bottom of all of this code that I've copy pasted is our actual logic. The logic here is solely for the purpose of defining the gaps in our dissolving sphere and discarding those fragments. So we return the same out variable that would normally get returned from this function. But before we do that, we do our calculation and then optionally discard if we should for these gaps over time. The regular fragment shader starts off just like our last example using PBR input from standard material. In this case, I've chosen to not switch the R and B channels because that's not relevant to the dissolve shader. I also disabled the alpha discard, but I may try to bring this back later. Moving on, you can see apply PBR lighting and main pass post lighting processing. In the end, this gives us an output color. We take that output color that the PBR functions calculated and decide which areas we're supposed to get discarded. We also end up defining a border color for those areas that fades from the PBR color, which is this color on the sphere, to the edges you see coming in, which is this greenish color. The alpha calculation here matches our pre-pass shader, so we're removing the same areas in our pre-pass as well as in our fragment shader. And that's it. We're able to use the textures that the standard material implements without having to re-implement it in the shaders. In this case, we're using a concrete texture as well as the normal map you can see here on the left. To get this effect to work, it was also very important to specify that this sphere was double-sided. This is one of the things that allows us to see the actual backside of the inner side of the sphere when we see holes in the front so that we can see that back wall. We also need to not cull faces. So again, this was something that I would love to use the standard material for, but we also needed to extend it. And finally, can you extend the custom materials that we create using Impl Material in the first place? Well, yes, you can. The docs for extended materials specify that this works in the same way for any combination of base and extension. The data from both materials will be combined and made available to the shader so that the shader functions built for the base material and referencing the base material bindings will work as expected. This puts all of the right things in the places that the base material shaders expect. And custom alterations, like with the ones that we just saw, can also be used on top. So that's extending materials in Bevy 0.12. I'm super excited for it to be easier to extend the standard material specifically, but I'm also on the lookout for new use cases now that we can extend our own materials as well. Hope you enjoyed the video and have a great rest of your day. I'll see you in the next one for more Bevy 0.12.